Good morning. Uh, great pleasure to be here, uh, as you can see. President Weiss, Provost Hansen, Jean Dillette, Chairman Strauch, and distinguished faculty. Thank you for this great honor and the opportunity to speak for a few minutes today. And my warmest congratulations to those of you who are graduating, 900 of you. This is an unexpected and much appreciated honor, and I will treasure the artifacts and long remember this day. I am mindful today of two of my own mentors and heroes who also received this distinguished honorary degree from Leslie University, Don Holdaway and Mari Clay from New Zealand. I've worked with faculty and students from Leslie University for at least 30 years. But even before that, my educational roots converge with those of yours. Edith Leslie espoused the work of Friedrich Froebel, who actually invented the concept of kindergarten. I didn't study at Froebel Institute in London, but I studied with many people who had and worked in tandem with teachers who received their preparation and graduate training there. What Froebel was about, and what I believe Leslie is about, is joyful, liberating, thinking education. And that is certainly what my good friends on your faculty are all about as they go about their work in Reading Recovery Literacy Collaborative and a wide range of creative efforts to expand the quality of life for children. From everything I've learned about Leslie, I conclude that people here see education broadly to include intellectual, social, and aesthetic learning. What people need to prepare for vocational success, yes, but even more important, to live a quality life from the earliest years on. Leslie faculty and students are also interested in and fully support social justice, something my own father talked about on a day-to-day -day basis in my home. They study it and they fight for it. My own area, as just mentioned, is literacy and language learning. And I've thought all my life about the liberation that comes with literacy learning. Here the issue is clear. There were reasons that it was illegal to teach slaves to read. Even today, the poorest children are the most likely to be taught with a mindless, unthinking curriculum and often don't get to read very well. It's not the mechanical act of decoding words that's so important. They get taught that very well and it is essential. It's the way the words are strung together to create language that enters the human being's mind from the earliest listening to a book to the extensive reading I know you all engage in for learning and also for pleasure. It's power over language. It's the thinking that emerge, emerges from deep comprehension of text after text, of talking with others about ideas and being inspired. As teachers, that's what we do. Now, the world is changing rapidly. Uh, sometimes some of us say, and not for the better. Um, a couple of examples. Brain-machine interface technology is fast moving. And by the 2030s, we will be able to connect our brains to the internet via nanobots, whatever that is, to provide direct brain-to-brain -brain communication. And virtual reality will be commonplace. Computers can generate music in the style of Bach and can write sonnets. Virtual performers can be created so that we can hear a new Beatles album or jam with Miles Davis. That is a world that makes me feel slightly queasy, but it's the one you live in and teach in. At the same time, we view on our television screens violence that makes us truly ill and divisions that are seemingly impossible to overcome. We're tempted to say with Yeats that the center cannot hold. Yet, I don't believe that. In fact, I wish I could be here another five or six decades to see what happens. I'm hopeful, especially when I see so many of you ready to use your prestigious degree to make a difference for children and indeed for people. I have a few words of advice and I'm not asked for advice very often, so this is my chance uh, with an audience of 900. 
And I have five points. One, don't try to be perfect. If you're afraid of failure, you will miss the chance to make a difference. You'll miss much of life. Make mistakes. If you have to, make one deliberately, just so you know what it's like. <laughs> Two, get into the whys of what you do, whatever your role in education. There's this idea that theory is sort of dull, and you just want tips and to be told what to do. And when I was a young teacher, I used to say, just tell me what to do. That's not what we need. I know now the power of understanding the rationales and the theories. The greatest practitioners I have ever known, and I named two of them earlier, were masters of theory. Hold a theory in a tentative way, always open because you're going to be learning more and more and more every year. Three, have lofty dreams, but break up your life into doable segments so you can see your success and the steps along the way. For example, on your list for next week, don't put things like write a book or create a masterpiece or teach all the children to read. Analyze the tasks. Take the first step, then the next, and then the next, and celebrate yourself for doing it. Number four, maybe this is the most important, find good companions. Years ago, I read a work of historical fiction titled The Good Companions that I never forgot. I'm sure it's out of print. It was about a straight-laced woman with a very narrow life who inherited a little money and decided to drive across the country. This was maybe the early 1900s. She met up with assorted companions, and they ended up giving theatrical performances. Well, the point of the whole book was that she discovered freedom and fun. Your own work should be exciting and goal-driven, but also fun with the comfortable confidence that you're with people you can trust and who expect you to grow and who enjoy your company as you enjoy theirs. They're out there. Go look for them. They're important for your own professional uh, learning and for your own professional health. I have been quite fortunate to have Dr. Irene Fountas, a great practitioner, a brilliant theorist, a Leslie faculty member as my co-author, friend, and mentor. And she, along with her colleagues here at Leslie, are truly making a difference with their great work in literacy. And occasionally, they laugh. Not worth uh, living if you can't laugh. And five, last. Never give up. I won't quote Langston Hughes directly, but often his poem about dreams goes through my head. Dreams cannot die, because if they do, they leave an emptiness behind, one that nothing can truly fill. My dream was to make a difference, still is, and I have, but not enough. But I haven't given up, and neither should you. It takes some courage to go into education now and more courage to stay there. Often we feel unappreciated and disrespected. Don't let that happen. It's noble. It's worthwhile. It's worth giving your life to do. Things may be occasionally seem bleak, but this is your time and those chances will come when you least expect it. I remember Robert Kennedy said, and I do actually remember Robert Kennedy, it is not too late to see the newer world. It is never too late. Again, congratulations, graduates and Jason. I look forward to seeing the world you create and the difference you'll make in it. Thank you.